Good morning. Would you join me in opening your Bible to 1 Corinthians 5? If you don't have a Bible, there is one there in the pew in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, please consider this Bible our gift to you. I'm going to be reading this morning from the New Living Translation. 1 Corinthians 5. I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be in mourning, in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in the spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. You must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed, and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns." Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Good morning, church. Hey, I just want to address, if you're a part of our church family, you might be thinking, why over the last few weeks have we done so much scripture reading and then In the sermon, you just read through the scripture again. Uh, We always read the Bible in our worship services. You'll hear it during worship. You'll also hear it as I preach. But also in the Bible, the public reading of scripture is something that's talked about as part of worship. And so we are always going to read the Bible, but we thought, hey, it would be unique for a season for us just to do a lot of it. And so on purpose, for a season, we're doing a lot of it in our worship services. Transition. This last week, I was online reading the news because everything you read online is true, right? (laughs) And I was uh, captivated by an article that involved some photos of children playing in the street. Uh, The BBC actually was covering an article where These children were playing in the street, but not just like, hey, they were kicking the ball, but they were actually playing around with like cars as they would drive by in the street. And the photos went viral and people got really upset. And the first few primary responses that got my attention were parents wondering, where are the parents for these children. So here's some of them running around in the street. Here's others as they were playing with the cars as they went by. There were even photos of them laying in the street. And parents were like, hey, if you love your kids, yes, it's good to play outside. We need to play outside more. 
but not in the street, in traffic. And the parents were crying out for the parents of these kids to, to step in and do something that many students, you probably don't like this word, some in our world really push back on, and that is to discipline them. Why? Is this, the, the, again, the, the, if you love these kids, all the comments were saying, if you care about these children, parents would step in and do something and, and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to discipline our kids, maybe like a ground you or like put you in your room or something so that they're not going to hurt themselves or other people significantly by playing in the street. Why do I start here? Well, if you are with us and we've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians in the first four chapters, Paul has been crying out for unity in the church and he said there's a problem. There was this celebrity following pride of the spiritual leaders in the church. Some were following Paul, some were following Apollo, some were following, and he was like, no, it's about Jesus. The solution he presents is I'm going to decide to know one thing and one thing only. That's Jesus Christ and him crucified. The primary message that will bring unity. And it's a very divisive message. But for those who know and understand who Jesus is and place their faith in him, it brings unity. Chapter 5, Paul now is going to have a subject change. He's going to start talking about what do we do with our sexual desires. And as he changes this subject, we're going to talk about it with him. So we've actually titled the next sub-series in 1 Corinthians, it's time to talk about blank. And he's going to talk about today discipline in regard to an issue going on in the church in Corinth. He's going to talk next week about handling conflict in the church. And then he's going to talk the following week as we get into the middle of chapter 7, about, I'm sorry, 6. He's going to talk about, for, for all of us that have desires that are outside of God's design, how do we pursue righteousness? How do we flee from the, the wrong sexual desires and pursue Christ? He'll talk about that. Then he's going to talk about sex and marriage. Following that, he's going to talk about singleness. And what do we do with our sexual desires? So incredibly practical stuff that maybe some of you don't realize the Bible talks so much about. Today, a first, discipline, discipline. Before we talk about discipline, I wanna just point something out. The word that discipline is built on for the English language, it's Latin. The root word for discipline is what? Disciple. And if Jesus has called us to go and make disciples of all nations, it would make sense that discipline might be part of it, right? What does discipline look like in the church? Here we go. I'm going to title it today, Discipleship, Growing to Live in Love Like Jesus Through Discipline. Paul's outline, I think, looks something like this, so I'm going to try to break mine down this way. Paul is going to point out a problem in the church that's going on. He's going to tell them the solution to this problem. He's going to then bring out an illustration that's powerful and helpful. And then he's going to talk about a tension at the end of the chapter. If you're here in the room, you don't believe in Jesus, or maybe you're here in the room and you struggle with what I'm going to teach today, or if you're online and you start listening to what the Bible says here and I'm trying to teach and you think you're gonna be better off canceling me, I wanna invite you to stick with us until the end because I think you'll see that Paul is going to cancel what you want to cancel in this whole discussion. Y'all with me? All right, problem. What's the problem Paul's gonna point out? The problem is that the church in Corinth has this tolerance of a sin that's going on in their church, but not just a tolerance, it's a tolerance that's accompanied by and with arrogance. There was a comic playwright that we still have the recorded stuff that he's put out 
at this time that had taken the word Corinth and he had made it a verb. He had taken the word Corinth and he had created a verb Corinthianize and to Corinthianize meant to tolerate all the different kind of sexual desires that you have and that those around you have. To Corinthianize at that point in time in Corinth there was some crazy stuff going on. And this tolerance of the sexual sin you'll see is going to seep into the church. And Paul says there's a problem. Don't cancel me, listen. It is actually reported, stuff went viral before social media, <laughs> that there is sexual immorality. This sexual immorality is one word in the original language, it's the word pornea, it's where we get our word pornography. In the Bible it refers not just to pictures but anything that you're pursuing sexually outside of God's design for marriage which we'll talk about over the next few weeks and a little more in a little bit. It's reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not what? Not tolerated even among the pagans. He's going to use the pagan here to talk about those outside of the church. You'll see in this chapter that Paul is going to tell the church that we, we deal with sexual sin issues differently as Christians for those that are in the church and those that are out of the church. And interestingly enough, I think it's reversed from the way that so many of us have addressed it. He's concerned about sexual sin in the church. And he says that there's this immorality among you that is not tolerated even among those outside the church. For a man has his father's wife. He doesn't say his mom. His father's wife would have been his stepmom. He's not physically related outside of the family, but he's in a relationship with her, and it's not just a point in time event, one night stand, it's a current ongoing thing. And watch what it says. And you are what? Arrogant. He'll use the word boasting again later in the chapter. Somehow in this sin that is in the church, not only are they tolerating it, they're somehow arrogant about it. As biblical scholars discuss this passage, some think what they were doing was actually talking about cheap grace or basically saying, hey, Jesus died for our sins so we can do anything that our bodies desire and we're gonna just boast in that. We don't know fully what was going on, but we do know there was a tolerance that was accompanied by arrogance. Ought you not rather to mourn? This alludes to what he's gonna be teaching a little bit later. In the Bible, there's a godly sorrow that Paul teaches us about that should lead us to repentance. When we are living in sin, and all of us have battled sin. In fact, if you're here today and you don't think you've had sexual temptations outside of God's design, one man, one woman for wife, if you think for wife, for life, if that's, then we probably don't need to talk about sexual sin with you first, we need to talk about lying with you first, okay? Uh, but when, when there's sin in our lives, for those that know Jesus, the Spirit convicts us and there's a godly sorrow that should lead to repentance that was not taking place here. Y'all with me? All right, so what do I want you to see? Here's another picture of kids playing in a street. But this street has been blocked off. It's been closed off, it's a safe place and it's now part of a park. Is it good to play outside? Yes. Is it, is it good to play in a park? In a place that's safe? Yes, students, yes. Y'all know that the Bible teaches us that God created sex and it is a wonderful and beautiful thing. But God has provided guidelines for us in order for us to experience what I believe and what the Bible teaches is human flourishing. God wants what is best for his children and so he provides guidelines for us to play in. Here's from our statement of faith in the church. We affirm that the Holy Bible is inspired and the inerrant word of God and the basis for our beliefs. 
based on Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, Matthew 5, Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 7, which is again where we're going to be in a few weeks, Ephesians 5, Colossians chapter 3, all of those chapters including other places, we believe that God wonderfully and immutably creates each person as a biological male or biological female. And that these two distinct complementary genders together reflect the image and nature of God. We believe that marriage is exclusively the uniting of one man and one woman in a biblical covenant relationship for a lifetime. That's what we believe. We believe the Bible tells us here's where to play. And do you know that all of us have had temptations to move outside of that? What do we do with that? All right, back to this picture. If the Bible gives us guidelines for what is human flourishing, and we believe that it's unsafe, it's dangerous to be outside of that, even if you don't believe that, can you just acknowledge for a moment that if we believe that, it would be unloving for us not to address this you understand okay so Paul says there's a problem there's a tolerance of something outside of God's design for human flourishing going on in the church and even an arrogance about it so what should the church do to solve this problem this week I learned I love it's such a blessing to get to study God's word because I always learn so much more than I can ever teach you but here's one of the things I learned at this time In Rome, outside of marriage, it was illegal to have sexual activity, okay? They didn't enforce that much. But it was also a crime, and they would enforce, incest. The punishment for the crime of incest, sexual activity outside of marriage, was that they would exile you. You were kicked out of Rome. Another way of saying it, you were removed as a Roman citizen. And if you were a Roman citizen and you knew that had gone on, you were told not to associate with them. Interesting. Because I think this will help you with the wording that Paul is going to use here in just a few minutes as his solution to the problem. What does he say? What does he say you need to do? Church, You need to remove them, but not remove them like Rome was removing. It was permanent exile in Rome. For the church, he says, I want you to remove them so that you can prompt in their life repentance and there can be reconciliation. He actually is bringing to the church a hope for the person that is even in the mess of the sin he's just brought up. Remove for repentance. Second half of verse two. Let him who has done this be what? Removed. What does he mean? He'll talk more about it as we go on in the passage. From among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced what? Judgment. If you were with us last week, he just said, don't judge the outsider. At the end of this chapter, when we talk about the tension in a few minutes, he's going to say again not to judge those outside the church. But those inside the church, what does he say? I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to what? What? (laughs) What? What is Paul saying here? uh, Okay, in the Old Testament, where God physically was present in the most clear way, Garden of Eden, when they were cast out, it was the place or the realm where Satan was in control in the world. The tabernacle, the temple, both are also talked about. The place where God's presence is most clearly seen. When they were outside of the tabernacle or the temple, they were where the enemy could attack them. And so I believe Paul is using language, and I'll show you in a minute, he uses it one other time in the New Testament. Language to say, hey, when, when they are not inside the church family, if they're going through discipline and they've been placed outside, removed from that, 
they're at a place where the enemy can get at them. Why would Paul want that? For the destruction of the flesh? What does that mean? You know there's consequences for our sin? Does, does, does Paul want this person to suffer forever? Is that what he's wanting? No. So that, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The Bible teaches when we place our faith and trust in Christ, something is happening in our heart. We recognize that we have sinned, we have done wrong, and there's another word it uses, repentance, that's happening. There's an internal turning. I am wrong. Jesus, you have died on the cross to forgive my wrong. Repent, believe, follow. Not we're following him perfectly. Not we're gonna live apart from sin. But our sin grieves us and we believe that he died on the cross for our sin. And so what does he want for this person? He wants this person to experience genuine salvation, a repentance, faith, trusting in Christ so that it would lead to life without regret. First Timothy chapter one, verse 20, the other place in the New Testament where Paul talks about turning someone over to Satan. He's talked earlier in the passage about these people really battling sin. And he said, I've handed them over to Satan. Why? So that they'll burn forever. Is that what he's saying? No that they may learn not to blaspheme. He wants them to experience in their life a discipline. Why? Because he loves them. He wants them to to follow Christ. We know that this removal is actually step four in the process of helping someone who's battling sin. How do we know that? Well, Paul teaches on it But Jesus, chapter 18, I'm going to show you his words here, is fairly straightforward about a four-step process when we see someone in sin. By the way, our role as Christians is not to be the Bible police. We're not out to try to get people. But if we see someone who is really in the street, playing in the street, it's going to hurt themselves if they are a Christian, here's what he says to do. If your brother... I think, again, spiritual brother, sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. First step, one-on-one conversation. If he listens to you, then he is gonna burn forever. No, (laughs) you have gained your brother. Again, it's a repentance that we're looking for, a reconciliation for the person with God. You've gained your brother. If he does not listen, step two, take one or two others along with you that Every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So step two, if he doesn't respond to you individually, you bring a few others with you. You say how to love. We want to show you that you're playing in the street. This is dangerous. It can hurt you. It can hurt others. Okay? If he doesn't respond to that, if he refuses to listen, tell it to the what? Church. So you bring it before the church. By the way, our church does this. We, we exercise discipline in our church church discipline and our process by the way if you come to us you can email me justin at first and I will I will yeah but our, we have a team that's uh, that is it's it's a graceful team but also a truthful team you, uh, and the first two things on the list was, this is our outline have you approached them individually in love If you have and they didn't respond, have you brought someone else with you before the church gets involved and the church gets involved and in love walks with them and it's always complicated. It's never really black and white. I mean, it's super complicated. But if if it's clear they're living in sin and they're not repentant, the fourth step is what Paul is talking about here with this person who's been boasting in his sin. If he refuses to listen to even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, which is the way they would refer to those who were on the outside. Y'all see? Here we are. If someone is playing in the street and you see it, we must love them enough. Not, not someone who doesn't know Jesus. We can't expect different. I mean, we still might say, hey, that could hurt you, <laughs> but we're not judging them. They don't know Christ. But those that are part of our church family in love, in love, the solution he presents here is something to bring them back to Christ ultimately in the end. Removing for repentance. The illustration. Illustration. 
a little leaven. Using Paul's words, your translation might use the word yeast. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Leaven used both as a noun and a verb here. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Does anyone know what leaven is? I just said yeast. Yes, it's kind of like yeast. At this point in time, wow. Uh, at this point in time, the way you would make bread rise is you would need some dough from previous bread that had a bacteria in it called leaven. And you'd, you'd have pulled a piece off of the last dough that rises, and then you put a little piece of that in your new dough. And what happens is that bacteria spreads. I want to show you a little video here. The guys are going to play for you. This is a fast forward version of that bacteria just spreading around the dough and causing the whole bread to rise. And for some of you have seen that in action, right? Some of you are thinking, man, I know what I'm doing this afternoon, right? Yeah. Uh, how many of you love bread? Yeah, they did too. But because of the way it spread, it became, for the Old Testament mind and for the Jew, it became an illustration for what happens when sin is connected to our lives. It doesn't just hurt us, but it hurts everyone around us and it spreads. And so, once a year, to illustrate the importance of sin being removed from our lives and what Jesus would do before Passover, they would literally cleanse their whole home of leaven. It also was a protection for them because apparently over time, if you keep using the same leaven, that, that bacteria actually gets worse and worse for you. So they would actually get rid of all of it and they would start all over again. And here's what he says. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. As you really are unleavened. Notice these words here. You really are unleavened. Sin was what leaven represented. And he says, you really are apart from sin. How can that be true? All of us struggle with sin. How can that be true? Well, here's what he says. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been what? Sacrificed. He points them back to the gospel. And he says, hey, guess what? There's a real king in a real kingdom. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. In his love, by his grace, he came and he lived a perfect life. It's what Jesus did. He became our perfect sacrifice. The one who did not deserve death died. Why? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. He took your sin and my sin on himself on the cross. And what did he do? He removed our sin in his body on the tree. He died and he redeemed you and I for God's glory and for our good. He rose again to prove that his death was different than everyone else's and he's coming back. What do we do then? Do we make ourselves perfect? No, because of what Jesus has come done for us. When we repent, we trust inside that what we've done wrong, we believe he has died for our sin. Believe and follow him. We become part of his kingdom based on what we know. We don't know what we've done, what he has done. We are unleavened. We are sin forgiven because of Christ, he also then gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to overcome sin. And does that mean we live perfect? No. It means we grieve when we fall. We need the body around us and we seek to pursue him. You'll see the difference. Not, not perfection, he's given us eternal perfection, but purification as we grow in and through Christ. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The sin, the sin through Christ, the leaven through Christ has been removed in the life of a believer. So, what about those who aren't believers? <laughs> Here's the tension. Grace and truth. When Jesus came, John chapter 1 tells us he was full of grace. Full. I do not think that you can over teach grace. I don't. That, that there, there is nothing 
we do to earn favor with God. Jesus is the one who has earned our favor with God. We can serve to please him in response to what he has done. But you know, I also don't believe you can overteach truth. He was full of grace and he was full of what? Truth. And here's the tension. Paul says, verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Apparently he had a letter before 1 Corinthians. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. He's saying, no, I'm not telling you that if you know someone that's not a Christian and they're living in sexual sin, you need to not be their friend anymore. That's not what he's saying. He's clarifying. Jesus in John chapter 17, he says he prays for his disciples that they would be in the world, not of the world, yes, set apart, in the world, not of the world, but sent to the world. We're we're to pursue those that don't know Jesus and show them the love of Christ. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. Not, I don't think he's talking here, by the way, about your physical brother. Many of you have siblings, aunts and uncles, cousins that don't know Jesus and don't pretend to believe what you believe. That doesn't mean you don't go to Thanksgiving. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is the spiritual brother he's talking about in the church family Bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality and now watch, he's gonna include everyone here on the list even if you said you've never struggled with sexual sin. Greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, what, what do these mean? A reviler, someone who's verbally abusive, swindler trying to cheat people out of something that is not theirs in the first place, maybe sometimes trying to make a deal that's more than they should be making for the deal. Rebecca's making a face at me, I'm always wanting the deal. Not even to eat with such a one. Does that mean if they struggle with sin in any way, you can't eat with? No, if they're not repentant, if they're not turning. Read out 2 Corinthians chapter two. Paul talks about someone who is grieving their sin and he encourages the church to run to them and to show them love and forgiveness that Christ has shown to them. It's different for someone who recognizes this is wrong. I need Jesus, you see. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Notice Paul says, I'm not talking about people outside of the church. If you're here today and someone who says they know Jesus and you don't know Jesus, someone who says they know Jesus has been mistreating you and telling you you're a bad person based on stuff that you're doing or whatever, it, it not motivate, if, if, I'm so sorry. For what I have to do with judging outsiders, it is not those inside, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you eight different times in the Old Testament we read those words to the people that were Jews. Tension, grace and truth. Church family, if you're here and you know Jesus and you're part of our church, we're gonna teach grace and truth unashamedly. Next few weeks, we're gonna talk a lot more about what that looks like. But if you know someone that doesn't know Jesus, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by him. You becoming their moral police is not gonna help. They need to know Jesus, right? If you have someone that you're seeing, that what they're doing, and they're a, they're a believer and part of our church family and it's dangerous, do you love them enough to say, hey, this is not okay? Do you want them to experience what God has for them the, the the human flourishing that he desires for us in all obedience so here's where i'm going to do i'm, I'm going to leave this on the screen and i'm gonna actually give you a few minutes i'm going to i'm going to be silent here i'm going to ask you what does this look like maybe for you in your life you need to just repent you need to grieve a sin that you're you're allowing to be present if you're part of our church family what does this look like for you if you're not part of our church family jesus loves you we're so glad you're here what does it look like for you to apply this today? I'm gonna grab something. 
thank you for joining us today for Worship Online. If you're in our area, we wanna invite you to come to physically connect to your local church. We would love to help you to live and love like Jesus alongside of others who are doing the same. If you're from outside of our area, can I challenge you to find a local church in your area that's gonna preach the Bible and exalt Jesus. Smash the like button, subscribe, share with friends, and turn on notifications if you'd like to stay up to date with us. And thanks again for joining us.